Um, I am a member of the um, Building an Inclusive Community in Prescott, and so I, I want to welcome you to the program then and now. I also want to tell you, in case you've missed it, that the program is sponsored by the Prescott Community Education, the Prescott Historical Society, thank you, Dallas, and, uh, uh, and the residence group Building an All-Inclusive Community. And the program is supported by a catalyst grant from the United, um, from the Wisconsin United Church of Christ. So we are most grateful for their support for our programs this year. Um, my goal in organizing this program was to sort out the differences between immigrants, refugees, and asylum seekers. To understand how different uh, policies, U.S. government policies, have governed different groups through time. Um, and those of you who know I'm a historian, so i history teacher. I have to think about these things. Um, and I, I, to understand the different policies that govern how our government treats these people uh, who arrive at our shores. We whose ancestors migrated or immigrated a long time ago um, often confuse the different sta legal status of very different groups. But no matter what group a person falls into, the motivations for people coming to our shores are often the same. They want a safe place to um, raise their families. Uh, they seek a place to earn a living, a decent living. And uh, some want to reunite with others who have, other family members who have lived here, who moved here before them. My Irish ancestors certainly had all three of those things in mind. They were the typical chain migration. You know, first Joe came, then Charlie came. Um, And my ancestors were fleeing what many people, even today, are fleeing. Discrimination, war, famine, um, and, um, and religious persecution. Over a million Irish, or about one-fourth to one-third of the population of Ireland, left Ireland in the 19th century. I can't believe that statistic. You know, it's just incredible. So, um, so I just have one other, uh, I want to introduce our panelists, so, uh, but first I have to get my glasses. <laughs> I cannot read my, so I hope you'll stay with me for a second. You know, the deacon always reads the gospel, and the last thing I always remembered to take with me was yeah. the gospel book. <laughs> so, I mean, the, my glasses to read the gospel book. So, anyway, our, our um, first speaker is going to be Michelle Wasslin, and she is the interim director at the Immigration History Research Center uh, of the, at the U of M. In her role, Michelle tracks and analyzes immigration research and policy writes on related topics, coordinates the work of the IW, uh, IHRC, and builds relationships with academics and other ex experts. Michelle has written extensively on immigration policy, has authored multiple books, uh, book chapters and publication, and has appeared in English and Spanish language media. Dr. Wasslin competed her PhD in Government and International Studies from the University of Notre Dame. I have to tell you all my Irish relatives had Notre Dame jackets and none of them went to college. <laughs> Catherine uh, Berger is a volunteer and outreach specialist for the Minnesota Council of Churches working in refugee services. Catherine has served in her position at MCC for over five years. Her work includes both direct service with newly arrived refugees and partnering with countless community and interfaith groups throughout the greater 
St. Paul, Minneapolis metro area to assist Minnesota's newest neighbors on their path to self-sufficiency. Catherine holds a master's degree in theology and has extensive overseas mission experience. Uh, our, our, um, Catherine will be our final presenter. Dallas comes in the middle. And we all know Dallas because he's a local, he's a local guy and a former high school, Prescott High School teacher who has won two national teaching awards. Now retired, da Dallas is the president of the Prescott Historical Society and has the time to pursue his driving passion of local and Mayan history. He is a current board member of the nonprofit preservation group North Woods and Waters of the St. Croix, which is a very ambitious project. This group has the goal of preserving the St. Croix watershed's history and natural resources. And most intriguing, Dallas actually worked on the Mississippi in, their to in the Mississippi River towboats and was a river pilot for the U.S. Coast Guard. So. Um, I'm going to ask Michelle to kick us off then with a, I asked her to do the impossible, which is <laughs> to give us a brief overview of the history of immigration in the United States. So, Michelle. <laughs> Thank you. And please let me know when we're getting close to my time. Sure. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be here today. Um, yeah, I was given this impossible task to talk about the history of immigration hundreds of years worth in 20 minutes, so we'll get to see how we do. Um, but first, I just want to tell you a little bit about the Immigration History Research Center. We are a multidisciplinary research center at the University of Minnesota, and we're dedicated to studying the history of immigration, obviously, um, and then using the lessons that we learn from history to inform our current national conversation about immigration, um, because that conversation tends to get very nasty unfortunately, and because a lot of people have very, very strong feelings about immigration, but don't actually have a lot of knowledge about the details of immigration, how it works, how it does not work, who comes, who doesn't come, how our system, um, how our system, our legal system, laws works. Um, it's difficult to have that conversation, so we try to educate the public about immigration using history so that we can have a better, more constructive conversation today. So today, we're going to take a brief tour of U.S. immigration history, and we are going to focus on the U.S. as a nation of immigrants. This is something we're all familiar with, right? We're a nation of immigrants. We're very proud of our immigration history. We're proud of our own family's immigration background. Um, and so um, we are going to look at that, but we're also going to look at us as a nation of xenophobia. And xenophobia is a word that we hear quite often, but I wanted to include the definition here from the dictionary. Xenophobia means an aversion or hostility to, a disdain for, a fear of foreigners, people from different cultures, or of strangers. And so we, throughout our history, we see these two principles that are kind of competing with one another. So we're going to look at immigration history and we're going to highlight just a couple episodes in our history that highlight our dual nature as this nation of immigrants and a nation of xenophobia. So this, I think, is one of the coolest slides ever. And um, I, you know, we can talk about this for hours. But basically, this is time, right? We start here in 1928 and it goes up to 2013, and the colors represent different nations of origin of immigrants. And so the, the, how wide the color is, that means there are more people coming from that country, right? So you can see how first, new nations, small numbers of immigrants, then we get this big increase in immigration, and we see that many of them are from um, Ireland, Italy, uh, Norway, Sweden, etc. And then there's a little dip, and then it gets big, and then it gets really big, right? And then we see immigration gets very much restricted. It's 
right? We're, we have very few immigrants coming at this period, and we're going to talk about why that is. And now we see another big increase. But what you can see, if you know, if you're able to see the colors clearly, is that not only does the magnitude, the number of immigrants change over time, but the countries of origin changes over time too, right? The colors that you're seeing on that end, um, the present day, are very different from the colors that you're seeing here at the beginning. So we're going to talk a little bit about all of that and why that is. Um, here's just another graph that shows the population of immigrants over time. So this blue line is the actual number of immigrants, right? So you can see here in 1860, less than 5 million immigrants, and it pretty, you know, here you can see that's, uh, that dip that we saw in the previous slide, and then it goes way up. So now we're at 45 million foreign-born individuals um, in 2020. So obviously, the absolute number of foreign-born people is much higher than ever. This line, though, is foreign-born as a percentage of the U.S. population, right? So you can see it was very high here. Again, big dip where we saw that dip on the last slide. And now it's gone back up again. Um, and it's about at the, the all-time high. About 14% of the U.S. population is now foreign-born. Um, so in terms of the absolute number of immigrants, absolutely, we're at a very high point. But the whole population of the country continues to increase. So in terms of percentage of the U.S. population, we are also about even with the highest percentage that we experienced back at the turn of the 20th century. Um, so yeah, so about 14% of the U.S. population is currently foreign born. Um, back in the 19 70s, it was less than 5%. So we have seen an increase over the course of our lifetimes, right? That it went from a very low percentage now to a high percentage of the population. And so I think, again, we could talk about this for hours, but I think this is what explains some of our ambivalence about immigration today, right? Is that people who were born in the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, in your childhood, there were very few immigrants in the country. And we've seen this big increase over the course of my lifetime um, in the number of immigrants and in the percentage of the population that is immigrant. And not only have the numbers increased, but people are coming from very different parts of the world, right? We're seeing very different cultures, different types of immigrants, and Immigrants tended in the past to be concentrated in a couple of states and even in a couple of cities in the country. And now what we've seen is they've been dispersed across the entire country. And so we're seeing immigrants in places that, you know, frankly hadn't seen a lot of immigrants before. So it's those trends in the last 50 years that are kind of sparking this, this national debate that I think we're having today. All right. So none of that was in my notes, <laughs> so we better get started. Okay, so when did the first migrants arrive in what's the U.S.? It was tens of thousands of years ago, right? Um, I show this slide because, you know, we see that immigration that started out of Africa to populate the whole world and eventually come here to the Americas. Um, that migration has always been a part of human history, of human society, um, that people left this area of Africa looking for new opportunities, going to explore new worlds. There's also evidence now that, that they were leaving in part due to climate change, that they were no longer able to live the lives that they had been living. So people started populating the whole world. And the first migrants arrived a long, long time ago. Um, here is a map of European migrations, right? This is the migration, the immigration to the United States that we're familiar with, right? So before the U.S. was the U.S., this nation of immigrants began as people converged here from all around the country, or all around the world, I'm sorry. We know there are about three to four million Native Americans, right? So the descendants of those first migrants living in this place before the European migration arrived. Um, Spanish, French, English, Dutch 
all came here as colonizers and started colonies there on the east coast of the country. Swedes, Danes, Portuguese, Germans, Poles, and others started establishing um, colonies, settlements on the east coast of the country. And that people were um, encouraging people to immigrate to the United States, right? That this was this so-called new land that was plentiful, there was need for labor. Um, most of the people who came were also Christian, um, although there were some Jews, even in the very early migration, Jews that were fleeing persecution in their home countries. So we started to see um, a lot of migration coming. And at that time, um, with that we're familiar with the 13 colonies. Uh, the 13 colonies, some of them welcomed immigrants, some were more hostile to immigrants, or to more hostile towards certain immigrants, right? And we see that in the very early United States history after we gained our independence, the sum of the, it was up to the states to establish their own immigration laws. The federal government was not in the business of immigration for a while, and um, some of them were much more hostile toward immigrants than others. Of course, we also had involuntary migration to the United States. Um, not only was there a major slave trade and slaves arriving in the United States, but there were also Europeans who arrived here as indentured servants. People who had been criminals, people who owed money, and they, were, they, they promised to come here and to serve a master. They had a contract, basically, and they had to work for years to work off their debt and then earn their freedom here in the United States. So that was a, a form of involuntary migration um, from European countries as well as the slave trade. So, you know, big, rich history of immigration. Again, each of these could be hours-long lectures, but we just have to keep moving along, but I just want to give a sense of the complexity, right, and the numbers and the various origins and stories behind people who were arriving in the United States. So as I said, it was the colonies and then the early states that had their own immigration laws. Um, and basically this was because people were arriving in ships and it was the people who worked at the ports who allowed people to either get off the ship or not and they could charge a tax for those people getting off the ship. Or they could put, you know, they could say if you were disabled, if you were handicapped, if you were unable to work, we don't want you here, right? Because you're not going to be able to support yourself. Um, if you're sick, if you have some kind of mental infirmity or physical infirmity, you can't get off the ship and work here. So each of the states had different policies about immigration. The Constitution of the U.S. actually says very, very little about immigration. And it doesn't clearly say the federal government, the national government, is in charge of immigration. It just wasn't something they were thinking about at the time, because we were this nation of immigrants bringing in all of these people for more opportunities, right? Um, so very early on, though, we can see from this quote, uh, Benjamin Franklin, uh, that there were preferences about what kinds of immigrants were uh, wanted over other kinds of immigrants. So here Ben Franklin, founding father, said, why should Pennsylvania, that was founded by the English, become a colony of aliens who will shortly be so numerous as to Germanize us instead of our anglifying them? So he was very concerned about Germans arriving in Pennsylvania and that they were going to Germanize the country. So we see early on there's already some concerns about um, immigrants and, and from particular countries of origin. All right, so as the United States continued to grow and prosper, um, manifest destiny, right? That it was the United States' dream, its goal, to conquer the entire North America. And so, um, you know, there was a series of wars and treaties and purchases until the United States became the United States that we know today, right? Um, so as the United States was expanding, as people were going westward, we needed immigrants, right? We needed more people to come and to settle all of these new territories that were being part, becoming part of this country. Um, 
And so again, there's this desire for immigrants to come, this opportunity to come to be able to escape discrimination, escape oppression in your home country, come to this new exciting land, have um, your own land, be able to own land, farm the land, and prosper here in the United States. Um, it's also important to note that much of the West, all the part here that's kind of yellow, right, that used to be Mexico, right? That was Mexico. And following the war with Mexico that we fought, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was signed in 1848, and Mexico lost that war, so they ceded this territory to what is now the United States, right? Um, and Texas had become part of the United States in 1845. We believe there were about 75,000 Mexicans living in this territory when it became part of the United States. Um, and so they became US citizens, right? When the land was ceded to the United States, it became part of the United States, they became US citizens. But what this means is that this used to be the border with Mexico, and now the border's down here, right? So it's not that people immigrated to the United States, it's that the border moved south, right? What used to be Mexico was now the United States. And of course, before that happened, there was already this tradition of people traveling back and forth between Mexico and the United States. Seasonal, circular migration, right? Um, and that, just because the border moved, that didn't change. This continued migration of people throughout this territory continued, right? And that's just important to understand as we move through history and we think about our current situation at the U.S.-Mexico border, right? It's this border, not that border, right? Um, and that, that much of what we consider the U.S. and that we are you know, protecting from the invaders was actually Mexico not that long ago. All right. So moving a couple decades through history, um, we're in the 1850s, and here we see our first real good examples of anti-immigrant political parties. Um, the Know Nothing Party, also known as the Order of the Star Spangled Banner, was basically created as an anti-immigrant um, party, political party. They were very concerned about the increased number of immigrants that were coming to the United States. Um, by 1850, immigrants were about 15% of the population, so just a little higher than they are today. And these nativists, these people feared that immigrants were leading to a rise in crime. They were leading to more poverty, more public expenditures on, on welfare, because these poor immigrants couldn't support themselves, right? Um, sounds familiar, right? Um, and who were these immigrants that were committing these crimes, so-called committing crimes, right? They were the Irish. They were very, very concerned about the Irish immigrants, the Catholics, who could not possibly be loyal to the United States because they were loyal to the Pope, right? Um, very concerned about Catholics, uh, that they didn't have the same work ethic as that Protestant work ethic that this country was built on, right? So there was a lot of uh, very vehement anti-Catholic, anti-Irish sentiment. And this uh, party, you see in this picture, this is an old ad, and you see there is a guy in an Irish whiskey barrel, right? And then on the right you have a guy in a lager beer barrel, and they are stealing a ballot box. So there is a lot of concern that not only are these immigrants coming and corrupting our society, but they're also corrupting our politics, right? And they're citizens, and they're voting, and they're going to steal elections. So a real concern that immigrants were unfairly influencing our politics. Um, after the Civil War, the Know Nothing Party did kind of disappear, but those anti-immigrant sentiments continued, right? As each new wave of immigrants came to the United States, we saw new waves of anti-immigrant sentiment. Going to skip ahead to the Chinese Exclusion Act. So here we had invited Chinese migrants to come to build the railroads in the West. Um, we needed them. There was the gold rush, 
and people were all going west, we needed to build more transportation, more uh, railroads. Um, people were busy trying to find gold and they weren't working. So we were bringing in Chinese um, immigrants to try to, um, to, to be part of the labor force. Um, and, uh, Chinese did come. They were a relatively small part of the population. There weren't that many Chinese that came. But of course, the Chinese looked very different. They seemed very different. They spoke different. Their customs were different. So there was, again, a lot of concern about these Chinese that we had invited here um, to be a part of our labor force. And people said, well, the Chinese are coming. They're taking our jobs. They're, now they're responsible for unemployment. They're responsible for declining wages. Also, the Chinese, they are racially inferior, and they cannot become Americans. So there was a lot of rising anti-Chinese sentiment in, on the West Coast, and the Western states started passing their own laws. And long story short, the Supreme Court said, no, you can't do that. The federal government is now in charge of immigration. The federal government regulates who comes and who can't come. And so what did the federal government do? They passed the Chinese Exclusion Act. They took those state anti-Chinese laws and made them national. But before they passed the law, they set up a, a committee in Congress, right? Nothing changes. They set up a special committee to study Chinese migration. And what that committee found was that Chinese were harmful to working class citizens and incapable of sharing social and political institutions established for the Aryan or European race. So this committee found that the Chinese could not be American, that they were inferior and could not be considered part of this country. Um, so the Chinese Exclusion Act basically did exactly that. It stopped Chinese migration to the United States and said that if you did manage to get here, because there were some exceptions, um, you could never become a US citizen. And you couldn't own land or property, right? Um, and over time, it was supposed to be 10 years, but they ended up expanding and expanding it. Not only did exclusion last much longer, but it eventually included most Asians. It included the Japanese and other Asians as well, right? And it was not repealed. Chinese exclusion was not repealed until 1943. And why was that? Because China was our ally in World War II against the Japanese. And so we had to um, allow Chinese to enter the US. But um, a new poll, or not a poll, I guess, a survey of Chinese Americans was just done by Columbia University. And I listened to the results just this past week and saw that anti-Chinese bias still continues in this country, right? And particularly during the pandemic, when unfortunately some prominent individuals blamed the pandemic on China, started calling it the Chinese virus, we did see this increase in discrimination, and not just discrimination, but hate crimes, hate crime incidents against Asian Americans. Um, and I should say, regardless of whether they were immigrants or not, right? You don't know where somebody was born by looking at them. And this new survey just found that nearly three of four Chinese Americans said that they had experienced racial discrimination in the past 12 months. And over a quarter of them had experienced bias or hate incidents, physical intimidation, assault, vandalism, or being called names or a racial slur. So we're still seeing that bias against Chinese immigrants, or it's a new form of it now, you know, um, over 100 years later. All right. So in the 1920s, I just, I want to go back for a second. So here, here we are now. So this, we're seeing this huge wave of immigrants, and now we're going to see what happened, right? What happened to create that narrowing that restriction on immigration. Um, and you might guess it was all of those immigrants who had come before, right? That there was this great concern, again, about immigrants and that the large numbers of immigrants, but not the numbers, it was who these immigrants were and where they were coming from. Because now they weren't Irish or English or German anymore. These were immigrants who were coming from Eastern Europe and Southern Europe. So, right, they were um, Italians. 
They were my people from the Carpathian Mountains in Slovakia, right? They were Polish, they were Ukrainian and um, Hungarian. And again, there were people who were very concerned using the same arguments, saying that these are not the right people to be coming here to this country, they're causing problems. So Congress, once again, established a commission to study this. And they studied it for years. And they studied it under the banner of progressivism. They were going to use science to study the new wave of immigrants. And what they found was that there were inherent differences between the races. They used scientific methodology, like measuring the side of pe size of people's heads, um, to study this, and they put out a 42-volume report that basically found that these new immigrants are not like the old immigrants. They're worse than the old immigrants. That um, they are less skilled and less desirable. They come from less progressive European countries. They, they're dirty. They live in dirty places. They're poor. Um, they're not smart. They don't speak English. Um, they, uh, I saw one quote that referred specifically to people from, from the Carpathian Mountains saying that they are uneducated, unassimilable hordes of people. Those are my people, right? Um, and so this, this study basically said what we need to do is establish a literacy test, that you can't come into the United States unless you can read and write, and what we need to do is limit people by their country of origin. So that's what we did. Um, next year we are going to commemorate the 100th anniversary of this very restrictive and racist piece of law, the 1924 Immigration Act. And this is the act that, I think some people still think this is how it works, um, it set up national origin quotas. It basically said each country gets a certain number of visas, right? And so Western European countries like Britain um, and G Germany and France they're gonna get large numbers, and people from other less desirable countries will get smaller numbers of visas. And to do this, we're gonna look at the census. Not the current census, because that would include all these people we don't want here. We're gonna go back to 1890, when the country was the way it was supposed to be, and we're going to say, based on who was here in the country in 1890, that's what we're gonna use to establish our quotas moving forward. So, um, Importantly, there were no numerical quotas on the Western Hemisphere. So people from Mexico, Canada, South America, though not many were coming, um, there were no quotas on people from Mexico. We needed cheap labor. We wanted them to continue to come and work. That doesn't mean we were going to treat them well. That doesn't mean it was going to be easy. But there were no numerical limitations on Mexico. This act is also what established the Border Patrol. So before, you know, there was a border, a physical border, but there was nobody there enforcing it. Um, this established the Border Patrol and basically created illegal aliens, right? Because now they, we were enforcing the law and people could be stopped, people could be sent back home. Um, many of the, before the Border Patrol became more professionalized, um, many of the first members were members of the KKK, they were ranchers from Texas and Arizona. They were people who really did not want immigrants coming into this country. All right, this is just an example of those quotas from the 1924 Act. You see Germany, 51,000, Great Britain, 34,000, right, Ireland there, 28,000, and then as you make your way across, all these other countries have 100, right? So, um, uh, Albania, Bulgaria, Greece, Romania, Czechoslovakia still at 3,000. But you can, you can see the bias here, right? That the Western European countries um, had large numbers and other countries had very small numbers. All right. And so that kind of explains why um, we see that big, that narrowing, that constriction in immigration because we, for the first time, really established very, very strict laws and strict quotas, and we established the um, agencies to enforce those laws, right? Now, 
we have to say that um, just because we restricted people, does that stop them from coming? No, right? That people still were coming. During the Chinese Exclusion Act, Chinese people still managed to make their way here. Um, even though the quota for Russians might have been 100, more than 100 were coming to the United States, right? For each restriction, we see a continuation, and that, that meant that that migration was outside the law. It was illegal, unauthorized, undocumented, right? Any time in our history we've tried to restrict people, what we've done is increase illegal migration from those countries. Does that make sense? Um, and so, even during those, those uh, very restrictive areas, we saw a rise in illegal immigration. And that was, again, Chinese, Eastern European. And in fact, if you look back in history, we had multiple amnesties over those couple of decades to try to regularize the status of those people who had snuck in. Basically, people would come in through Canada and into the United States, and if they were caught, they would say, okay, go back to Canada, and when you come back in, you'll be legal, right? There were different um, amnesties, and it was mainly those Eastern Europeans, Russians, who benefited from those, right? Um, so, you know, again, amnesty is this nasty word, and we hear it in today's conversation, and that, no, no, we can never have an amnesty. But throughout our history, again, as we raised restrictions, we also had a series of amnesties to try to help people regularize their status. Um, there was also something called the Registry Act that basically, if you were illegal in the United States and you lasted long enough, then you could eventually legalize your status after a period of time. You weren't going to be legal for 30 years. If you lasted that long, you could apply for legal status after a period of time. We don't have that anymore. All right, so we're getting towards the end here, I promise. How am I doing on time? Yeah, you? you can finish up. Are you sure? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so 1965 changed everything. Um, it was after World War II, right? We had defeated the Nazis. We had defeated this regime that was based on white supremacy, right? Um, and yet we still had these very racist laws. And there was this movement saying, wait a minute, we can't um, continue this very racist policy and keep these people out of this country because of their, their race and their ethnicity when we just you know, fought this terrible war to try to end that. Um, also the civil rights movement and we, you know, immigration reform became part of the civil rights movement to try to end that racial discrimination in our immigration law. So in 1965, we created the law that we current, basically it's the basis of our current immigration system. It says, you're not admitted by your country of origin, you're admitted by the category that you fit into. Either you are a family member of somebody who's already here, right? Um, most of our immigrants are admitted through the family-based immigration system. And if you have a close enough relationship with somebody who's in the United States already, you can come here as a family member. You can come here if you have a certain education or job skill set that we need, right? So for economic reasons, we bring people to work here. And then um, refugees, people who are fleeing because they're facing persecution in their home country. That was also included in this law. Now I will say that even though that sounds great, we're getting rid of the racial categories the, and the quota system, it was still set up so that it would maintain the same ethnic balance here in the United States, right? These um, members of Congress said, well look, if we base it on families, then we already have all these white people here in the United States, and they're going to bring their family members here so they'll be white also. So we'll maintain this racial balance here in the country. Um, however, it has not worked out that way, and this 1965 Immigration Act and the amendments that have followed have really been successful in um, expanding immigration and really changing the face of immigration in this country, right? So now, through this current system, we're receiving people from all over the world, um, and people from Asia, from Africa, from uh, the um, Oceanic region are coming to the United States through um, family ties, 
and through um, our employment-based immigration system, and some other ways as well. Um, I'm not going to talk about the Mexican immigrants in South America because I really wanted to focus on other groups that we don't normally talk about. Um, but this is our current immigration system, and that's kind of a simplified map. Um, it is really complex, really difficult. It does not, again, it does not treat everybody equally. Um, some people simply have no way to come to the United States legally. There are no lines for certain people. I hear this a lot. Why don't they just get in line? Well, A, this is the line, and B, some people don't have that line that they can get into. It's really complicated. During the discussion, I'd be happy to talk more about what the current system works like. Um, and then finally, I'm just going to end with this. This is our current foreign-born population. So foreign-born, anybody who was born outside of the United States and came here in one way or the other, right? Except for like babies who were born to service members in US um, uh, military bases, right? They're not counted as foreign-born because they're natural-born American citizens. So here is the whole foreign-born population. Most people are surprised to know that 45%, nearly half, are naturalized US citizens, right? And then another quarter are legal permanent residents, people that we have admitted to the United States permanently. And then other temporary immigrants that were admitted legally, right? So three quarters of all foreign born people are legally in the United States. And 23% about are unauthorized immigrants, undocumented, illegal. And about half of them are people who cross the border without any authorization, but half are people who had one of these temporary visas and simply didn't go home afterwards. So we can talk a lot more about that unauthorized population. It's not who you think it is. Um, it's very diverse, it's very different. But I wanted to just touch on some of the, the common myths and misperceptions that people have about immigration to the United States to kick off that conversation too. All right. Thank you very me. much, Michelle. Yeah. Sorry, I went too long. Um, Dallas Eggers is going to talk a little bit about the local population and how we came to be this. My favorite room in the building. I remember walking in here about eight years ago. It was a dirt floor. I saw the wall of glass and I thought, this is my life. And so, glad to be back here. You know most of you, um, I have no history degree, I'm pretty much self-trained. As you know, you can poke a hole in me and I'm full of hot air and I'll fly around the room. That's okay. But, immigrants, my family. Um, you can follow, uh, someone in my family did a genealogy study and we are related all the way back to Governor Bradford coming off the Mayflower. My own family, basically, my father and mother went to research it about 40 years ago, 35, and they found out that we were either German, Dutch, or Belgian, depending upon who won the last war. That's kind of how it went in Europe. Um, St. Great River Watershed, showing you this now, 10,000 square miles. In 1790 to 1800, there were a total of 371 Europeans living in 10,000 square miles. Basically trappers and fur traders. Maybe a couple of explorers, that was it. And there wasn't really a good reason for them to come here, because transportation didn't allow it. To get here from the east was a major undertaking. Also, we were a good place for criminals to hide, to go to the frontier. Well, that's just the, the facts. And so, things didn't really change until a um, little different map up here. Here's the United States. I'm going to get my magic phaser from Star Trek so that I can uh, kind of show you a little bit about this. It really started with the Louisiana Purchase in 1803. We, we bought all this land, millions and millions of acres, and we didn't know what was there. So what we did was we sent people up here to take what? Zevalon Pike. We've been to Prescott. Lewis and Cox. Zevalon Pike uh, actually reserved Prescott 
for a potential military fort. Because we're at the confluence of two rivers, we have the high bluffs we can see, and then they also look at Fort Snell. Thankfully, you picked Fort Snell. <laughs> Thankfully, you picked Fort Snell, and we would have been to St. Paul. And there were some more shysterisms that went on in history, but I'm, St. Paul is just fine at about 20 miles away. <laughs> Most lands in the Northwest were held by the Native Americans. 99%, probably almost 99.9. The Louisiana Purchase changed that. Surveying didn't start right away. We didn't start surveying up here until really about 1819. So you couldn't buy any land. It wasn't surveyed. But people started to move in. And they started to move in for several reasons. Well, by the way, the surveys of this region were not completed until 1896. <laughs> so it took them 70 years to finish the survey of this area. And so if your family moved in here, you couldn't buy land because it was not surveyed. So that's just part of it goes. Um, but once they did sur survey it, if you came in and you established a homestead and they found you were living on federal land, they would grandfather you in and allow you to stay. They didn't make you leave. If you had a homestead and a farm, we said they work hard enough, they can stay. Some people, they made them pay for the land, some they did not. And land was such an insignificant cost. I guess when you don't make much, a buck and a quarter an acre is a lot which was kind of the standard price. Next major step was the Native Americans. They owned it, the treaties. We finally started the treaties in about 1780s with some small concessions. And really in about 1839, the major treaties were starting to be signed in the Midwest. So the treaties that were signed, basically in this area here, all of these, this area here, was ceded to us by treaties by the Chippewa, Chippewa Ojibwe of the Dakota Sioux. Then we can now have people moving in. And that's what happened. The last treaties in this area, in the Midwest, were basically the 1860s, a couple of the early 1865, this type of thing. But most of it was done. Great Bush West, that was us. And you tell the people now, and they think, Northwest, that's Washington and Oregon. Well, not now. That was us. Basically, over half the settles, settlers that came into this area were migrants from the United States. Over half of the people who moved in here were migrants from other areas in the United States, bringing their families, their traditions, or whatever. Okay? The other half were migrants from around the world, just coming from overseas. During this period, ending in 1910, people from over 40 different countries immigrated to the United States. Some a small number, some a lot of men who mentioned the Irish and the German and the French and this type of thing, Scandinavians. Um, you can go to the Prescott History Center downtown tomorrow, and we have Prescott journals from about 50 years, and you can read through the journals, and they talk about the immigrants in Prescott in 1905, 1908. And I don't like to say this, but this is how it was written in the paper, the dirty Italians. It seems like we have kind of taken a turn not liking everybody. Everybody got their turn, it seems like. And eventually, you became whatever happened. On the steamboats, originally, it was the Irish, the dirty Irish, is what they were called, and they were being bossed around by the English and the Anglo-Saxons. Well, as time went, the Irish moved up into pilot houses, they became the first mates, and now they've washed around other lower class Europeans and blacks after the Civil War. And so it kind of went through the steamboat here. They had to come across the ocean. The first steamship to go across was the Savannah in 1819. It took 29 days to go from Savannah, Georgia to Liverpool. A sailing vessel would have taken five to seven weeks, so it was faster. But in a very short period of time, they got it so you could cross the Atlantic in a steam-powered vessel in eight to nine days. And that's what the rich people did. They used the steamboats, the steamships to get it. Those on the other end of the economic spectrum, they were still in sailing vessels that took four, five, six, seven weeks to make the same crossing. Um, the problem was the people in the bottom 
because of their cramped conditions, unsanitary um, diseases set in. A tremendous number of them died when the voyagers, simply because of typhus, diphtheria, whatever your disease was, a lot of them perished on before they even got to our shores. The St. Lawrence Seaway, a number of them came in, it was estimated in the 1800s that 25% of all the immigrants who came up to St. Lawrence in the United States died from disease before they ever arrived at their settlements. 25%. Some groups were higher than that. And so these people risked their lives to get here. They were our ancestors. They were our ancestors. When they got here, we had a rudimentary immigration system, but it wasn't very sophisticated. They just kind of had to sign, and most major cities on our coast have some type of an immigration system. You'd come in and sign, and put your name down, hi, I'm Bob, and they would let you in. And that's kind of how it went. The Upper Midwest was a long journey at that time. By horse and wagon from the East Coast, we were lucky if you could get here in two to three months. Two to three months. Because there's no railroads, there's very little river transportation. The roads are mud, if there aren't any roads. And so people who came here were adventurous, and they were brave, and sometimes you wonder, you gotta check their sanity, but they did pretty well. Um, no real roads and bridges. Hostile Native Americans, and Native Americans kind of learned that, hmm, maybe we're not getting the good end of the stick and maybe we shouldn't really accept this. So the Native Americans along the routes originally were a danger. They were a danger. And uh, they kind of went away a little bit. Things changed in 1825. Erie Canal. The Erie Canal was a major opener to immigration in the Midwest. Because now, instead of going overland, you can go north on the Hudson River, take a left, and hit the Great Lakes. And it was much easier to travel by river or by water than ever by land. And so that opened up the flood in 1825 was a major, major. And the reason is, if Marv here has got his covered wagon along with Marsha, every time he comes to the little creek, he's got to ford it, or he has to unload everything in the entire wagon, take the wagon across, then go back and get all your goods and go back and do that. Well, every river, it took them forever to get anywhere. Whereas by water transportation, you could come across the Erie Canal. You could come up through New Orleans. And later, the Welland Canal. The Welland Canal is a canal that goes around the Niagara Falls, which raises the river 396 feet. And it allowed transportation to enter the Great Lakes from that. There was another kind of an oddball little canal. I gotta show you that one because I really didn't know much about it. It was a work of wonderment. This is the Pennsylvania Canal. And what it did was it connected Delaware basically to the Ohio River. Started here, this was the canal, then it came up here, and then you took this canal, then you went down here, and you finally ended up in Pittsburgh, which is the Allegheny. And on tow boats, I've been about right there, and I've been about right here. And so they came here, now you're on the Ohio River, now you can get a river pass. And the Pennsylvania Canal wasn't necessarily a canal. It was kind of strange. They would lift things by rail cars, kind of a rail car, and it really was not a major inlet port. But another major opening, another major opening, so we've got the Welling Canal in 1848, also the Illinois Canal. The Illinois Canal connected the Chicago River in Chicago. So right here, and it comes across here and hooks up to the Illinois River by using locks and dams. Now you have access through Chicago to the Midwest, and you can do it by water. And so those four main things really boosted immigration into our area. To get from Cincinnati, sitting right over here, to St. Louis with a horse and buggy, you're looking at a month. On a boat, it's a week. That's a big difference to you as an immigrant. Because when you got here, you don't have a home, you have no food, so they came as early as they could and they tried to get up north as fast as they could so they can build their log cabin, so you can plant some food, and you can get ready for the winter. And so speed, they were willing to spend the money to save the extra two months of travel simply because it gave them a much better chance of surviving. I might live through this first winter. 
because they got here a month earlier. And so those kind of little things we don't really think about. And I do have notes, so you all kind of stay on track. Most of you know that doesn't happen very often. <clears throat> Up from New Orleans was a little difficult because the mouth of Mississippi would get uh, occluded by sandbars and this type of thing. So that was a little tough sometimes. Um, a little better now. Once the Mississippi was reached, it was steamboat heaven. Steamboats really depended upon minerals, lead mainly, from the Galena area, and military supplies. The only military supplies upriver. There weren't a lot of immigrants until these four avenues opened. All of a sudden, you have a torrent of humanity arriving on Mississippi Riverbanks by various means, and here they come. But above St. Louis, there was a little problem. Right about here, there was the Des Moines Rapids. And everybody assumed that no towboats, no towboats, careful, I'm moving this up 100 years, no steamboats would ever go through the rapids. The motor vessel Virginia proved that wrong in 1823. The Virginia was the first steamboat to make it to St. Paul. The pilots figured out how to go through there. They waited for high water. Now they figured out we can get up the Mississippi River. And what they did with the steamboats is they re-engineered the steamboats. The southern steamboats were kind of underpowered. They were big. They had a deep draft. Some of them needed, uh, could meet at 9, 10, 12 feet. In the upper Mississippi, you're lucky if you found four feet. And so the lower river boats couldn't come up here. Plus, our currents up here were much stronger, and until they came to a high-pressure boiler system and horizontal engines, they really couldn't make it because the steamboats just could not make it up here. They were under power. So they ended up high-powered boats, a little shorter, much lower draft, some of them two feet, some of them four, some of them five, and they could make it up here. It was a big change, a major change, because now the immigrants made the steamboat companies rich. Very, very, very rich. So the early steamboats, they were OK, but the new ones got pretty fancy. Okay? The railroad first reached Rock Island in 1854. Here they come. Within five years, there were at least seven or eight ports on the Mississippi where the railroad reached, and the people poured in. Migrants and immigrants from all over the country and all over the world. If you had a steamboat during the 1850s to the mid-1870s and didn't sink, you were wealthy. You literally, your boat was loaded with humanity every single trip. Now, they came in two different kinds. There were excursionists, like Linda. They just up here to look at the scenery. They're not really coming here. They're on a pleasure cruise. That was the cruises of the 1800s. We go on Caribbean cruises and that now. They still did it back then because they had heard these stories from various travelers and various explorers about the beauty of the upper Mississippi River. And these wealthy people wanted to come and see it. Mark Twain said in the Lake of the Mississippi, the upper Mississippi is the most beautiful river in the world. And having gone from absolutely one end of the navigable, well, actually, Lake Itasca to down, uh, I think you might be right. The 700-foot bluffs and this type of thing are amazing. And so all of a sudden, here they come. Here they come. Now, steamboats were based upon which boat do you ride on? Which boat do you ride on? If you're wealthy, you ride on the fastest boat. The fastest boats could charge more. The slower boats charge less. Now, the cabin passengers, they were the elite or the people who had a little bit of money. And some of the immigrants who came here were fairly wealthy, maybe not wealthy, but at least had enough money to pay for better passage. They would pay anywhere from $12 to $20 to get to St. Paul. Now, you're in the cabin upstairs. You've got a room, all this kind of stuff, meals included. The other ones, they usually paid 50% or less. They slept on the deck wherever they could. They slept on top of stuff, under stuff, around stuff, and no meals were included. One of the books I was just reading, the guys who worked on the steamboats were talking about the immigrants. The workers on the steamboats would eat this food and would be done with it. There would be a bone, and the immigrants would take the bone and gnaw on the bone because they were so hungry. I mean, so that's kind of how it went. That's kind of how it went. They brought up everything. 
They brought bedding. They brought tools. They brought livestock. Uh, sometimes the livestock would be carried on the deck of the boat. Sometimes the boat carried a barge along with it. And they put cattle and horses and pigs and chickens or whatever on the barge. Uh, barge were used for many things in the steamboat era. Sometimes they were just for a party. Sometimes the party didn't go so well. That the Jim Grant and Seaweed was after when 98 people died. So barges were also used to bring them up. Where'd they go? Some came up and entered the logging business. A high percentage of them first came were Finns, because the Finns were loggers in their own country. They came up here and had the skills. They came here with the skills. So they came up the St. Croix River and they applied for these jobs. And you would ask them, what skills do you have? And they said, well, I can do this and this and this. So the Finns were hired many times to be loggers, to be foremen on their jobs and this type of thing. And so they moved into the logging industry. Plus, the farmers of the St. Croix Valley. St. Croix Valley basically was unfarmable when our ancestors first got here. Basically covered with white pine forests. But we slaughtered the forests. And then we pulled the logs out, dug the stumps out, and we produced wheat. And what happened was the wheat farming moved up the St. Croix River as the logs were cut. And so in the wintertime, most of the farmers, not all, but over 50% of them worked in the logging industry in the wintertime. Logging started when the ground froze. Logging ended when they blew the dam up and shot the logs down the river. And then you went back to your farm and worked in the summer. And then in the fall, you again came and worked in the logging. So the stories about all the loggers traveling around and being drunks and all this kind of stuff, you know, there were a few of them. Most of them were just our neighbors out trying to make a living. Out trying to make a living. Um, those who became farmers in the St. Croix, they did pretty well. They did pretty well. We started chain migration, which you mentioned. Chain migration, it wasn't the term then, but what would happen is I would send letters home to my family, to acquaintances, and I would say, you know, this upper Midwest is really fabulous. You should come. And that happened a lot. That happened a lot. Um, another thing that happened up here, immigration was also seen by every state, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, Illinois, and Missouri, as a necessary thing. And so most states had an immigration board. Most counties had an immigration board. Some cities had an immigration board. And what they would do is they would produce these fancy slick brochures with these wonderful drawings, and they would send them to Europe, they would send them to the East Coast. The famous one is 34 pages long, written in nine languages, and it was shipped by the thousands overseas. And so we invited them here. We needed workers. And that was the only way, that's the only way you could do it. Then you come up here, and boy, did they come by the millions. Certain areas around here, you can be identified by the people who moved in. Stockholm, Wisconsin. That's the Swedes. They came on the motor vessel War Eagle in 1853, and they settled Stockholm, Wisconsin. They also went back up in the hills in London, the Sabi, and so you have a highly, high Swedish population there. Plus, as you drive around, you look at the churches. And if you do this enough, you start to realize that you can tell by what churches are there what nationality you say. There'd be a Lutheran church here, a Baptist church here, a Presbyterian church here. We didn't see many Catholics for a while because we were very discriminant against Catholics until eventually the Catholic church started to show up also. So being a lunatic, as I drive around, I look at the churches and then I look at the mailboxes. And unfortunately now they don't put names on mailboxes anymore, so I'm really bummed. But I could drive around in the last 34 years and I could tell the nationality of the people in the area by looking at mailboxes. And it was always, well, simple minds are usually amused in my case. A couple other places, Cambridge and Pine City, Minnesota, that's Swedish. That's the Swedish area. But they came, they were pretty much a little insular, but they did work with it. Baldwin, Wisconsin, that's where the Dutch went. That's where the Dutch went. That's where you drive into town and they have a windmill, because it was the Dutch influence. Then you go to Somerset in the Richmond area, that's a French. Domination. So you go up there, you'll see the last names of Rivard and this type of thing. And uh, Hudson and River Falls, German and English. So you can kind of, as you travel around, you have different peoples living in different places. And you kind of tend to hang with your own people. But eventually, that didn't really take over. 
The immigrants faced tremendous odds. They weren't good. They're going to die on the ocean. They're going to die on the way here. They're going to be in a steamboat explosion. Um, brave people, industrious people, energetic people. But they sometimes really struggled. There was a boat coming across Lake Pepin, and I just did a six-hour history tour down Lake Pepin and back last Friday. If you missed it, we'll do it again. But anyway, they came and they wanted to get to Red Wing before dark. So the captain said, I need to get a little go faster. So they fired at the boilers, made them hotter, and what happened was sparks shot out of the chimneys and started the boat on fire. Just, oh, just a boat from Frontenac State Park, maybe up about four miles, about halfway to Red Wing. Now the captain knew what he was doing, he immediately beached it. So no people died. However, all of the belongings of the immigrants were burned. Their clothing, the housing supplies, in many cases money, everything gone. So here you are in the Minnesota wilderness with nothing. And you've got your family. And you're wondering what's going to happen. What happened was the people in Red Wing got together, they went to their homes, they brought them new clothing, they took up donations of money, they found home articles, they found tools, and they helped these people get enough stuff that they could make their trip to Granite Falls, Minnesota. So as with most things in the human domain, if we skip the bad stuff, about 99% of us are pretty decent people, or even more, and even more. They did the right things. Free tickets were offered. You gotta pay for a steamboat, you can't, they offer you free tickets to come if you settle on their land. Also, some strange things. Many, in view of what happened in the last four or five years, many of the cities had plague houses or quarantine houses. So as you came up the river on your steamboat, you got off and Mars Hackett and Coffin, and they'd say, well, what's wrong with you? And you say, I don't know. They would have the doctor come and evaluate you, and they'd give you two choices. You could go to the plague house, which Prescott had one, which now where the tourist park is, and you can stay there, and we will feed you and this kind of stuff until the doctor says that you're okay. Or get back on the boat and get out. Those are the only two choices. It will help you or get out. There was nothing in between. Uh, and I can't stay. think of what they would do in the 1800s if you didn't want to do either one of those because frontier justice was sometimes a little bit severe. But Prescott had one. Land cost a buck and a quarter an acre, but what would happen is, if I get it now, the rich people came and it all up. And so you people, when you got there, these shelters were charging you five and six dollars an acre and making themselves wealthy, but the immigrants couldn't afford to buy dirt. The regular people in the area, they thought the speculators were just a little bit above pond stuff. Not much, just a little bit above pond stuff. And there are some other things that, uh, fake city sites, between, between St. Louis and St. Paul, there were at least 700 fake cities. They would go and they would send a brochure saying, oh, I have this one, miniature, miniature Hastings. Within four miles of where we sit was one of them. So this guy goes, he sends all these brochures out east. We've got four churches, we've got general mills, we've got schools, we've got post offices, all this kind of stuff. They got here with one wooden shack with a printing press. <laughs> And that comes from the stories of George Byron Merrick, who was a Prescott boy, and was in the Steamboarding Hall of Fame. When he found out what they were doing, he was, in the wintertime, he was a printer. He got out of there and left, because he knew what was going to happen when people came here. Another one is Rolling Stone, Minnesota, down in Bowl Wabasha. So, you came here from, in this case, they came from Germany, and they came from Sweden. They sold you land when you were in Europe. When you got here, you come to me, the towboat pilot, and say, well, drop me off at Rolling Stone. And I said, what? Well, drop me off at Rolling Stone. It's right up here. And you say, well, there's no Rolling Stone. <laughs> well, we got there, and I dumped you off, and there was nothing. But they had your money. They had your money. And so that's, there's, those people are always around. Also, some of the banks, the banks were criminal organizations at the time. There was very little banking reform. There were no restrictions. To start a bank, cost you five bucks. Then Mark went and printed $20,000 worth of bills. He signed them as a president. He handed them to you. You signed them as a vice president. You signed them as a vice president. Five others did that. You give your money to everybody else in the room. So when you come to Prescott, you don't have any money 
with Barb's name on it. So they assume that your money was good. The clerks on the Mississippi River in the 1850s and 60s found out that 90% of all the currency in the upper Mississippi River was absolutely worthless. What they were doing is they were borrowing you the money to buy your land, and to you to buy your land, they were betting you would go broke. So they would get your land. And if you didn't go broke, the bank closed and they left. There were a couple banks in Prescott that were in this room. They were in this room. Um, schools, schools and churches in our area, many were written in German, many in Swedish, and we had a couple, three of them at the History Center, so it was quite common. It was quite common. Um, my father, who was probably, uh, he knew a little bit of German, not very much, but enough to probably get a coffee and buy a bathroom. And uh, because of that, he was hired to interview Germans trying to leave Germany at the end of World War II. So his German came in handy. He worked in Copenhagen for six and a half months, vetting people who were looking to leave Germany. What was he doing? Looking for Nazis. He never told me that until he was 93 years old, because he had signed a secrecy act with the government. He died at 94. And so things are strange. With the railroads reaching us, the steamboats dwindled. The railroads took over. But during the steamboat era, they really don't have hard numbers, but they feel that two to three million immigrants came up the Mississippi River in 40 years. So that's where our ancestors came from. And it's always interesting, and you know what? The immigrants are still coming today. And we'll get over this. So thank you, folks. Thank you. I want to thank everybody for yeah. the for the invitation to come and be with you today from across the river. I won't say that I'm from St. Paul because St. Paul got some bad press a little while ago. <laughs> but uh, Minnesota Council of Churches uh, is is basically I, I like to describe it as kind of an umbrella organization. Um, for the Protestant, mainline Protestant churches in Minnesota, okay? And there are 27 different denominations or judicatories as they're called. And Minnesota Council of Churches provides resources and leadership and guidance around the areas of, of um, racial justice, social justice, um, native indigenous reparations. Um, in a couple of weeks, someone's coming to, to uh, invite you into a conversation, respectful conversations. And uh, the, the largest program in Minnesota Council of Churches is Refugee Services. And so I'm really happy to thank you for the invitation. There, there are several tie-ins with what our, our um, two speakers have shared with us. So I, I got so excited. I thought, oh, I just want I want to add my two cents. And so <laughs> if, let me, I mean, Stop me, obviously, when it's time. So, um, let's see. All right, I'm going to try this gizmo here. There we go. Um, current current situation now. Okay, we have we have a big piece of the history. Current situation. First of all, let me just say, um, not all immigrants are refugees. If you can, I should have had a, a, a slide up here with a nice Venn diagram. Not okay. Not all immigrants are refugees, but all refugees are immigrants. Okay, does that make does that make sense? We're we're going to talk now about the current situation right now with a very small subset of immigrants to the United States and then and then locally. These numbers just right now, I just put this, I just updated my, this slide this morning and what I could do. These are the latest numbers out of the United Nations High Commission for Refugees. Okay, I couldn't do the lower, you know, the bar graphs. I didn't have time to do that. But at no other time in the history of the globe have there been so many displaced persons. And now it's just the latest statistics as of June of 2023, 108.4 million people are forcibly displaced worldwide, okay? Um, the graph down below ends at 2021, you won't be able to read those. But, I mean, just, you know, in the last 10 years, it's been, we, we, I think the 
last statistics that we had, I think about five years ago, we, we crossed the 100 million mark. And now there are 108.4 million displaced people. That doesn't mean that they're all refugees or immigrants or they can be internally displaced. That's the largest, that's the longest graph on there, the bar graph. Um, they have not crossed an international border. They are seeking safety within their own country and their governments are not taking care of them. For the purposes of this talk, we're talking about um, the 29.4 million. Now, they don't add up right here because I haven't changed those numbers. But we're talking about refugees only, okay? People who have crossed international borders and who have been given a particular status of refugee. And then there are, there are a lot of work I'm not going to talk about asylum seekers, but they're still in process. They have crossed a border, all right, but they have not yet been you know, uh, given a, a different status. So they are still seeking protection. And uh, so what we're doing is talking about the 29.4 million refugees right now who actually have that status. Um, no, wait a minute. I have to, there we go. But, but who is a refugee, okay? And, and we're trying to clean up our language at the Minnesota Council of Churches. We, you know, we talk about refugee societies and so forth. And, but we don't wanna, we don't wanna you know, pigeonhole people. It's, you know, if you're a refugee now, you're, you're not gonna be a refugee forever. And so what we'd like to, we try to say, a person with refugee status, because that's all it is. Being a person with refugee status is simply one of several humanitarian immigration statuses. So just, just a little thought there, if we can, if we can help um, with the language. This definition, can you read it? Is that okay? Mm -hmm. This definition has been around since 1951. It was established, again, obviously we're talking about after World War II. Um, it was accepted you know, by, by many, many nations. The interesting thing about this today, I just heard the other day on, um, I don't know if it was NPR or NPR or on CBS or whatever, but people now are beginning to say that this is too loose. That, you know, just because a person is a member of a particular social group, let's say a labor union or, a, um, or a, um, something to do with, with gender identity or something like that, that shouldn't qualify people to, you know, for refugee status. Well, it again, we're creeping back into like now, now we don't want certain kinds of people. We don't, we do not think that that will qualify you as being persecuted in your country, but you know what it does in some countries. People are persecuted if you are a member of a particular social group. Anyway, so the talk again is out there as to redefine or to tighten up this definition of refugee uh, from 1951, okay? So keep that in mind um, that we are talking about people who the work that we do and I don't know how the refugees who are coming, they have a status, and I will get more into that in a few minutes. So, once a person does have refugee status, okay, so they have, they have left their home, they fled their home because of a fear of persecution, they have um, reported to a, a UN camp, or they, they are now under the protection of the United Nations, what are their choices? You know, for instance, a, a, a Somali person in Kenya, or a uh, Congolese person in, in Uganda, or um, wherever, you know, in the neighboring country. Well, they do have some options. They could go back home, and it's called voluntary repatriation. That is not always, you know, real, a real option. Um, you've, you've heard and you've read about certain countries, I'm just thinking of Myanmar right now, where the administration is saying to the people who are still in uh, Thailand, the, the Karen, the various Burmese ethnicities, or in Bangladesh, you can come home, you will not be persecuted. Well, you can be sure, they're, they're not going back to Burma right now. Uh, they don't feel it's safe, it would not be a good idea. Or, okay, so that's voluntary repatriation. It probably, it does probably happen in some parts of the world. Or you could remain in that country of asylum and you could become a citizen there. You could, you know, uh, carry on as usual, you know, start a family and so forth and build your life called local integration. 
Well, the, the trouble is that many of those countries where people have fled to themselves do not have the resources to indeed you know, see that that would happen. The, either you know, there's, there's, not, there's not enough jobs, or there's, you know, where would they live, what would they do? There's just not enough resources for that to happen. And so the, the, the option of local integration also is not really great. So what's the third option? And this is, again, what we're talking about refugee resettlement. It would be resettlement to a third country. And indeed, it is a last resort. Nobody wants to cross an ocean. Nobody wants to cross a continent. Nobody wants to go really far away from your home and start your life all over in a very, very strange place. People don't want to do that. And I think that's what you know, uh, Michelle was talking about, some of the myths you know, around out there, as if, you know, like that's what people people just want to come here and, and you know. But who wants to leave their home? The other day, and this is just an aside. I had I was giving a talk with a um, one an Afghan uh, family. I mean, I was giving a presentation, and one of the Afghan young women in this family came to give her story, present her story. And somebody had asked her at the very end of her personal story. They said, "Well, what are your hopes now that you are here in the United States in Minnesota?" And she says, well, I hope that my family can have as good a life as we had back in Kabul. Mm -hmm. Now, can you imagine? That this not, they're not looking for a, you know, a, a great US life. They, they want to have at least as good a life as they used to have. And of course, the thing is still in a very tender time. We've only been there for you know, a short amount of time. So, all right, that's the idea. The resettlement to a third country is, is, is not the greatest option, but it, it is an option. However, out of that, I don't think I changed the number on this, but out of those you know, 28 million refugees worldwide, less than 1% will be resettled to a third country. Less than 1%. Now that's, I mean, the math, I think the math is like 270,000 people. Um, it's, it's quite a process. It takes, it takes a lot of, you know, again, Michelle was talking about regulations and who's in charge of doing all of this and, you know, the, the, the resettlement programs of the federal government have, have you know, all the, the guidelines and the rules and, and it's, it's an amazing, it's an amazing process to go through the vetting and so forth. So just keep that in mind now out of the, out of the 28 million refugees worldwide. Those who come to the US, those who go to other countries, less than 1% of all of them. Okay, so kind of coming down then a little bit more, drilling down as as we've been hearing that that we have we have welcomed refugees throughout our history. Now I'm talking refugees, not just not just immigrants. Um, again, we talked a little bit about the first U.S. legislation for refugees was um, 1948 to provide for the displaced Europeans after World War II. And it was in 1980 that it actually, the Refugee Act of 1980, actually established the modern refugee resettlement program right now. That's when it became part of our written law. Okay? And, and much of much of what was put down in 1980 really has not changed that much. But that that's like okay now it's if, if we agreed to this we, we were signers of the 1951 protocol in Geneva, which by the way if and that protocol stated that people do have the right to seek protection to cross over international borders. Well, if that's true, then there's a isn't there a concomitant responsibility of those people on the other side of that border to welcome them? And that's what we said yes to in 1951. And so it, and until 1980 then, we, we wrote it down and it became part of the body of our law. It was always designed, even though there's a, there, there's a huge amount of federal regulation, it was always designed to be this public-private partnership. So. Yes, the federal government, you know, does give money, and yes, um, they do determine a lot of things of you know, who can come and, and when and all that. 
but they rely on you and me to be member, uh, to, to partner in this in this endeavor. Um, I think I'll add this right here. For every refugee that comes, let's. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I apologize. It's always Minnesota, but the same the same program here for the refugee resettlement agencies in Wisconsin. Um, an agency will receive about twenty-two hundred dollars per refugee that they accept. Okay, so we get twenty-two hundred federal dollars to do our work. Now, most agencies will give will use direct, like half of that, a little bit, we use a little bit more than half of that in direct, directly for the family. You know, we, you know, the, the rent for the first two, three months, food, um, what, whatever it is. But so we, we like to share it. There's no, there's no formula for how much you do give to the family directly. We don't give them the money directly, but we will be paying the rent and so forth. And then the other, the other less than half will run the office, pay salaries, and, and keep the program going. So now, what was I saying? All right. So that that twenty two hundred dollars per person is nowhere near what it costs, what it takes to resettle. Or let's say it's a family of four. Okay, so eighty eight hundred dollars. That is nowhere near the amount um, that's needed to really resettle. So this whole idea is the public-private um, partnership, and and uh, so we need people. We need people to work with us and to be volunteers, to be co-sponsors, and so forth, and to give the you know give the volunteer hours you know, to to the work. Up until 2018, the United States had been, even though we are still a, a global leader in protect in the protection and the welcome of refugees. We had been the leader. In 2018, Canada surpassed us, and I have a graph in a minute, um, in the number of refugees that they welcomed. So that's, that's our reality right now. So I think it's also important that we realize that, that you know, we, we, we talked about, you know, um, Maureen was talking about the difference between an asylum seeker and, and refugees and so forth. I think it's important for us to remember that when refugees come here, they come with that status, okay? They have, they have been through their approval process. They have, they have been through the scrutiny in a camp or in, at an embassy or in the city someplace, in, a, in, a, in an urban center. They have proved their persecution for those reasons that I showed you initially. Um, so that's done. They, and they have gotten their, their humanitarian status of refugee, um, as seen through the eyes of, of the UNHCR. Asylum seekers have to do that. When they cross the international border at our, either our northern or our southern um, border, they have to go through that process. And so they are asylum seekers. They are not yet even asylees. So, I mean, I, just keep that in mind. Um, because this is, this is, I think this is very important for us that, that as, and as soon as they get here, they're ready to take off, okay? They are, they are ready to work. They are on an immediate path to citizenship after five years. There's a, there are benefits, there are a lot of resources that are available to them. And they will, they cannot be sent back except if there's some kind of criminal activity and their refugee status will not be taken. After a year, they be, they can apply. I mean, all the processes they can apply for permanent residency. But they they you know, un unless something really hurt and they participate in some kind of criminal activity, they they are here to stay. Okay. Um, let's see. I'm just trying to think here. Okay. Um, so how does all this happen? How, <laughs> what, what, gets, what gets the ball rolling? Well, just this week, as a matter of fact, the, uh, President Biden did sign the presidential determination. It's up to the, the administration to decide each year how many refugees the United States is going to allow in, okay? And every year it's, it, it's you know, every year it's determined. And um, he just signed it. It's 125,000 individuals 
to come to the U.S. this fiscal year. Okay, so starting tomorrow through next September 30th, the idea is that it we would like to we would like to say that it would be a goal. Let's see if we can't work at getting 125,000 refugees into the United States. It's not unfortunately seen as a goal. It's seen as a ceiling. In other words, we will not accept more than 125,000. Um, it's, there's no minimum number set as well. Um, also, the, in this presidential determination, in addition to the number uh, being able to be, uh, to be received, uh, the administration sets the priority nationalities, populations, where they're going to be coming from, from what regions, and we've just heard about this family reunification program, which nationalities are going to be kind of more fast-tracked than some of the others. Um, it's interesting, people say, well now, how is it, you know, how is it decided which countries are going to be, and, and, and numbers per region around the world, like Africans or Southeast Asians or Europeans or South Americans. Um, well, it has to do with humanitarian, you know, situations in those regions of the world, but it also has to do with our, the interests of our country. <laughs> so, I mean, that's, that's life, isn't it? So you know we have a we have a huge political interest in the Horn of Africa. Well, we have so the, I don't I didn't make it a slide with with those regional numbers that again just came out this week. But again, um, from the Congo, I think I have some numbers coming up. But from the Congo, from from Somalia, from Ethiopia, we we are we're interested in seeing that that part of the world stays as stable as it can. Okay. And I have to say, I mean, we know that if the U.S. is active in doing some of these, these humanitarian um, uh, interventions, so to speak, we, you know, that does say a lot for, for some nations around the world. Well, if the U.S. is doing this, we surely can do this. So that's how it get, that's how it starts. The president sets a number, and from what parts of the country that they're, what parts of the world they're going to be coming from. All right, now. Um, this, okay, this just shows you, as I, as I was saying before, you know, the, the, blue, the blue graph line is the US, the next, the orange, you can't see that, is Canada, and then comes Australia, the European Union as a whole is the yellow uh, bar, and then Norway and New Zealand, so these must have been the, the, larger, the larger participating you know, uh, countries. But as you see, in 2018, Canada did surpass us in the number of refugees admitted. And a lot of this is political. A lot of it, you know, when, when COVID came, everything shut down. When there was a Muslim ban, a lot of the refugees just were not allowed to come in. So, um, oh, by the way, this is, this is not, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter who's in office, really. I mean, this is not a, um, I mean, it needs to be a, a bipartisan effort. However, you know, it can be, so determined by that, um, by the political party. Now, <laughs> this is my wonderful slide. <laughs> I love this one. Um, and again, I apologize, these are Minnesota numbers, but I did look up a little bit in the Wisconsin Department of Children and Families. That's where the resettlement um, efforts are, are, are organized here in Wisconsin. And they're pretty similar. They're they're not they're not exactly the same. I think Wisconsin may even have resettled a, 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 a few more re refugees than Minnesota has over the last couple of years. But they're very very similar. Okay. So we're only speaking about the metro area. There are there are there are five actually resettlement agencies in Minnesota, and in the metro, though, four of them are operative. There's one down in Rochester as well, Catholic Charities, and there's one up in um, St. Cloud. And your resettlement agencies, again, are, are the number of them are very similar to the number in Minnesota, and they, we all operate the same way. We are all under what's called the cooperative agreement uh, with the federal government to provide the services um, that, that we're told to provide, okay? So, but as you see now, it's interesting. Um, had I shown you maybe five years ago this graph, Somali, the Somali population, can you see that? Yeah, 21% of those admitted this, this past fiscal year, which is, is ending today. 
So 21% of Somalis, Congolese is the next largest number at 17%. The, it, Afghans are an interesting um, uh, population there because the ones who have come in this fiscal year really came as refugees. When the Afghans uh, came two years ago and the Ukrainians, they came with humanitarian parole. Okay, so uh, that's another immigration status that the U.S. has that that we can use where where nothing else applies. Okay, so there's you know you can be a refugee and asylee, you can be a victim of human trafficking, you can be an Iraqi or an Afghan um, special immigrant, get a special immigrant visa, you can be an Amerasian. Then there's this other category of humanitarian parole, and that's how the Ukrainians are coming, and that's how the Afghans came. However, as of what is it? It's October. Earlier this year, any of the Afghans who were coming in came either with refugee status or with special immigrant visa. And the special immigrant visa category uh, applies to those whose whose family members worked with the U.S. government during the war. Okay, either in Iraq or in Afghanistan. So you see the you see the variety of cultures there now. There is, um, I wonder, someone mentioned there is going to be a move now starting, this is the fiscal year just ended. There is going to be a move more with receiving, admitting, welcome, welcoming refugees coming from the Western Hemisphere. And that would be mostly from Central America. And there, there could be a little bit more movement um, for Venezuelan refugees. But some, some have come in this past year. But, but um, again, the, the populations from the regions around the world, um, it's, it's been set. And already at, at Minnesota Council of Churches, we are, we are seeing many more um, Guatemalans, El Salvadorans, and Honduranians. Oh, another one of those humanitarian uh, categories is the Cuban Haitian entrance. They have a, they have a, a kind of a, their own program. So. It, it, it does it does change from year to year, but this is what it has what it has looked like this past year. So, I would suspect of this number of nearly 1,400, in addition to the 1,400 individuals who came in as refugees, there would also be oh I have that number here. Also, there would have been about another um, 100 or so, 200 who came in with that special immigrant visa. In other words, they had been working with the U.S. military from either Iraq, um, Iraq or Afghanistan. Oh, I just want to, I, I forgot to mention this. Last year was also, uh, the presidential determination was also 125,000. We made it up to about 60,000 as of today, okay? End of fiscal year. Now, you know, it's kind of interesting because, you know, I remember I said it's not a goal to get to 125,000, unfortunately. But because during COVID and because of the Muslim ban prior to that, the, the infrastructure, the, the system in, in these countries, the, the personnel who would go to the camps under the auspices of the UNHCR to do the vetting, to do the processing, it had just been decimated. And so to build it up again, People were saying, well, if we can reach, if we can get in half of the 125,000, we should be doing well. Well, this year, it, it indeed, uh, the numbers are probably 52,000 plus another 20. So maybe, I, including those SIVs, we did take in more than 60,000. So now that the system has been reestablished in the camps and in the halls of government again, Perhaps we can get closer to that 125,000. This um, is the Minnesota chart, right? This is only um, Minnesota. Yeah, right. other states would be taking in from different places, perhaps. Perhaps, but it, mm -hmm. thank you for asking that. It's not totally different here in Wisconsin, for instance. But like, for instance, we don't get a lot of Syrians here. In here, listen to me. Maybe in the Midwest, maybe was, but for sure in Minnesota, we don't get a lot of Syrians. You can see it's only three percent. I don't know what it is for Wisconsin. And, and why is that? Like, why maybe let's say the uh, Wisconsin gets 6% Syrians. Right. Well, what some, makes that some, difference? All right, good question. Family reunification, oh, remember yeah, we so talked about that. Going where the populations have been resettled, it's kind of nice to keep 
you know, not, not, to make, not to make ghettos of all these different right. cultures, but family reunification. And the reason, let's just say, um, you know, families coming who have no family here, then, then it's, it's like, okay, so particular resettlement agency, you know, they, they, need, to, they need 200 more uh, individuals to meet their quotas and their, you know, what their capacity is. And so people who are coming for the first time, then maybe there will, they would send in, or they would, they would allocate those particular nationalities to places that, that need, that need mm -hmm. to reach their capacity. Um, when the Afghans were coming, you know, it's like we didn't, well, you know, <laughs> What happened with Fort McCoy? There you go. <laughs> you know when, when, when that was the, one of the bases that received, uh, you know, straight from the evacuation time, um, they were they were dispersed, so to speak, all over the country. You know, and that these there were other bases around around the U.S. where they went, and then either they they went to places where you know they had no relatives, or they or the Virginia. I was going to say that was. A lot of people, want, a lot of Afghans wanted to go to Virginia because there, there's a very large Afghan population there. But so, but they, and then Texas, I believe as well. But they were, they were saturated. They could not take anymore, and so, you know, they were dispersed to other in other states. I was working for a while with Wisconsin with the Afghan refugees oh, that wonderful. came here. Yeah. And one of the things we were very concerned about is, like you said, they had a little different status the ones that came. Um, and there was a great concern as how do we get them so they can stay longer. They didn't have that indefinite, uh, uh, it didn't seem like they had indefinite status here in the United no. States. It wasn't like some of right. the other yeah. refugees. Right, yeah, those coming with the special immigrant visa, that's yeah. like they special come immigrant with, visa, right. yeah. but most, I mean the vast majority have come with humanitarian parole and you know that it was, it was, it was extended for two years and everybody is working really, really hard to see if they can if they can actually achieve asylum status or some of them have enough documentation to prove that they could receive that permanent visa as a special immigrant visa. Yeah. I'm looking at the clock and I'm just I'm just concerned. Um, first just to just to go back to the process. Okay. As I had said before that the 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 federal <laughs> government it's it's co this cooperative agreement is quite, quite detailed. Long before, okay, we have 90 days to work with refugee families when they come. We have 90 days to provide a whole lot of services. This starts with the day one, but prior to day one, we need to find an apartment for them. We need to find a, 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 a safe, two things, safe and affordable, okay, whatever affordable means. Um, we need to stock it with groceries. We need to have a hot meal ready for them when they come from the airport. Um, we need to bring a pro a seasonally appropriate clothing and all of that sort of, so a lot has gone into before the day one starts. So this is just the first 30 calendar days, okay, of things that an agency has to take care of if we're going to be able to keep doing our work. And this is where that, that pr the private part of the public-private relationship comes in so much. You know, we, can't, we don't have enough staff to do all of this work. We, we try, and, um, but it's, it's very, very difficult to do. So we, we, we ask for volunteers, we ask for sponsors. You know, can you take them, can you go and get the, them enrolled in school? Can you get the adults in their, their ELL courses? Can you show them um, where their markets are? Can you help with community integration? Can you uh, take them for their refugee health screening at the local you know, public health department? There are so many things that indeed we need to focus on. And in a way it's not bad. If you, you know, get it done, get them going, people coming in are, are eager to get started. We'll have a family come and bring them to their apartment, and the very next day, the case manager goes to visit. Are you okay? How was your night? Kind of a what do you call that? A welfare check, making sure they know how to operate everything in the apartment. And invariably, I mean, this is amazing. One of the adults will say, "Well, how, when can my kids go to school? 
how soon are they going to be able to start school? And, and when, when am I going to be getting my job? You know, so it's, it's amazing. They're ready. So I think it's probably good that it's, it's very heavy front loaded. Um, okay, I'm just going to quickly finish here. I don't need to tell this group uh, why, why we would do this, the, the benefits of doing this. You know, people, we, you know, we may, we may welcome refugees for a lot of different reasons. Some of us do it for religious reasons. Some of us do it because of, we talked about economics a little while ago. We need workers. Um, we know that. I, I don't need to give you statistics on that. Some people do it because, yes, we are an immigration nation. It's all good. It's, it's all good. Um, and and, it, and it, it is. It's, uh, we, we hope that we hope that we have compassion and believe in compassion and dignity for all. And we are interested in keeping families together. And of course, our newcomers, they bring us so much. It's, it's, we benefit from this. We don't do this for ourselves, I'm not saying that. But there are so many things that they, that they do bring to us. And they have, I mean, they have so much to give, and we learn so much. The, the, um, the statistic that Michelle gave before about, what was it, 15% foreign born, right? Mm -hmm. Is that true? 14, okay. yeah. Oh, whatever there was, okay. Um, it's interesting at this, this gentleman in his market stall. Um, there's a statistic that shows that there is a higher percentage of businesses started by foreign-born people than by native-born folks. You know, it's, it's kind of like an inverse, it's almost like an inverse proportion there. But again, they, they, they're interested in, in um, sharing what they have and, and, and serving other people. And so I, I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, so, and what, so what do we believe? Well, come on, this little machine, okay, there we go. Um, by and large, by and large, refugees, they are, they are resilient, they find employment quickly, they do learn to manage their stress, they learn to navigate all the systems. Not everybody, of course, not everybody, but they have so much to give us. And, so, and they, they, they share this hope that they have for a better life. It's, it's totally inspirational um, to be in this, in this work. So, I hope I've given you a little bit of a taste of what it is now when refugees come to the United States, come into our communities, and what it takes. It's, um, it's quite a process. Um, for, for, I work with co-sponsors, I work with volunteers, and, and, maybe, and some of you have, I'm sure, have, have done this. Those relationships that are set up last for years. We try and say to the, to the co-sponsors particularly, from day one when you start working with the family, start working yourself out of a job. In other words, you're there to teach them how to navigate the system, how to do things, how to get on. And so don't do things for them, <laughs> do things with them. Because we do, we do want to, the, this, and the sooner that happens, the better it is for everybody. They, and and, and they, they would learn so quickly. So anyway, I could go on forever about the the, the joys and the challenges of, of resettlement, but it's a, it's certainly a pleasure and thank you for this. Thank you very much. I'm going to quickly thank all three of our panelists. I really learned a lot that I didn't know, and I so appreciate your coming to give us um, the information that you did provide today. Thank you very much. So, um, anyone have questions for any one of our panelists? I have, a, I have an observation. I was just up to St. Cloud for my 50 year reunion, and we got to take a tour of the new high school. And I uh, was surprised to learn when I graduated, there were no minorities in St. Cloud, literally none. Uh, I don't know, 60,000 metro area. And the population now, the student population at Technical High School is 40% Caucasian, 60% people of color, mm -hmm. uh, which is just remarkable. Um, I know when, when a lot of Somalis were settled in St. Cloud, I know this because of friends who live in St. Cloud, boy, there was a lot of 
unhappiness. Yeah, it's really hard, and I, I'm, and, and I think in the long run, of course, this is going to be fine, and probably is fine, I don't know. But I, who decides that? Who, de, who decides, I mean, you know, so this population is very conservative, very insular, probably very xenophobic. Here come the Somalis. How did that get decided? <laughs> yeah, you, you know something. I know, no, I just, I, it's, it's like, you're right. It's kind of, well, I don't know why, but Lutheran Social Services has a very large um, office up there, okay? Yeah. Catholic Charities is up there. So it, I, I can imagine and, it was driven <laughs> by the good intentions. So. No, and, and it's all great. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's just that I know it's, it's been, it's been a real learning curve. Oh, it's been, it was very difficult. With yeah. other groups before that, too. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. Yes, I, I, um, my sister, I had to point out that didn't we displace the Native Americans? There you go. There you go. Right? <laughs> did so, so, yeah. I think we're from, displacing from each other over the years, too. <laughs> yeah. From my experience teaching in the schools in St. Paul, in about 2000, 2001, when the Somalis were coming in large numbers, the biggest thing getting to know them as a person. Once you knew them as a person, it all went away. So that's the big step. Once you know them as a person. Well, it was really fun. It was, it was homecoming dance Saturday, so all these students were there, and there were so many Somali girls there. Forget Somali guys. They're not going to not gonna decorate for them. But it seemed like it seemed so normal and, and healthy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, I was concerned. Catherine, the question I wanted to ask is, I know about that humanitarian status for the Afghanis, mm -hmm. um, and how do they get, I mean, they only had two years here. Mm -hmm. how, how do you get settled in that time, and uh, get, then they have to get another kind of status to stay, and if they can't stay, where do they go? They're not going back to is. Afghanistan, are they? But yeah. that, that they were given a temporary status, and I think the understanding would be that Congress would pass yeah. a law that would yeah. allow them to remain and, and have they? No. No, no well, that's what I was we afraid of. all our members of Congress yeah. and ask them to pass the Afghan, Afghan Adjustment, Adjustment Act. Act. That's because yeah, I'm worried about that. Congress there are built, there's anything. a lot of Afghanis yeah. here now. Yeah. And how do right. and how do they stay? And if they can't stay well, here, where do they go? Well, well right. It's interesting. We're, we're, we're grateful, right now at least. It's a very slow process of of adjudicating their asylum cases, at least, oh. if, at least in okay. Minnesota, nobody has nobody has, has failed. Away. Nobody has yeah, been I mean, deported they don't want to yet. Go back, right? I mean, but they'd like to go back, but it's not yet a no, good no, environment they can't. to go back. So, yeah. but yeah. it's an option, right, that the yeah. president has to right. grant parole to people to let them in, okay. but. You don't have any of the benefits of no, being a refugee. No, that's what I was concerned and about. And you don't have the, the certainty of a permanent status, and you're kind of hoping to string along things until you yeah. can get that. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not ideal. Yeah, Congress has to pass a law. <laughs> Is it mostly churches, like the Council of Churches, Lutheran Social Service, what I work with? Uh, is it who, What are the organizations that have been taking in and doing this work of assimilating yeah, there, the uh, right there are there are needs. some faith-based organizations and some non. Like you have Wisconsin International Institute, mm -hmm. we have okay. a Minnesota in fact, the, and they're yeah. under a, a national. They're called voluntary agencies, and I'm forgetting what their name is. But the, the majority of them are faith-based. World Relief is not faith-based, so they have a national agency that. I mean, it's a it's a huge puzzle, you know. The yeah. State Department, you know. Well, thank it, God yeah. for all of you who are doing the yeah. work and choose to do the work. And I, I know the group that I was working with is on the Wisconsin side through uh -huh. Lutheran Social yeah. Service. Those people that were, were doing that work, I mean, it's amazing what you do and what the volunteers do that come exactly. to help exactly. with the resettlement. Exactly. And I also know that we didn't get many over to the western side of Wisconsin because mm -hmm. they wanted to settle them. In, in groups where there were other Afghanistan, again, Afghanis, because, so a lot of them were over by Milwaukee right. and uh, some in the Madison area. Mm -hmm. I think they finally, uh, we had, we took about five in Eau Claire um, oh. that we were working with, but they wanted to put them with other, you know, right. groups at least so you could speak in your native language to somebody once in a while. It was interesting though, the Eau Claire people insisted 
and said, okay, so we, we want, want to have some of these people here, and we will put together the resources well, to make that happen. That's so so there's a welcoming, a yeah. a welcoming uh, spirit yes. there that is wonderful. I've got a couple quick, quick questions, um, one for each of our guests, um, and it's Michelle, right? Yes. <laughs> So you had a graphic about showing kind of the different paths um, through immigration, and you, you know you said that even that was a simplification. Um, I will probably pick up a copy of your slides, but is that a graphic that we can find online somewhere? And um, you can, and there's actually even a, a newer version of that. Multiple people have tried to take our whole crazy system and put it into. Um, so if you if you Google, you know, yeah. like U.S. immigration system flowchart. Okay. You could probably find that, but you can also contact me, and I'm happy to send okay. it to you. Yeah, yeah. I, I find that very interesting. Yeah. my contact info is on the slide, so yeah, I'd be happy to share. And there was another question about a slide with the pictures and the wave, so yeah. I'm happy to, if you just email me, I will send those to you okay. and show you where you can find them. And I, um, I wanted to ask uh, Catherine if um, you shared a statistic, uh, one, less than 1% yeah. of mm -hmm. the displaced people. Right. And um, so, right. In any, you know, that's dynamic from year to year. How many people are displaced? And, you know, things erupt all over the world. Is that an annual number, or is that kind of? You mean like how it how it how it kind of settles down? I, yeah. I bet that hasn't changed in a long time. Yeah. <laughs> I think I that's say. overall. Yeah. All of the people displaced, yeah. only one percent each year. Or each year, or just oh, it just all each year, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just yeah. kind of the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's still it's, a, it's, it's, it's as many people maybe or more each year that are displaced right. than actually right. Right. find their yeah. uh, find some place to settle. Are the rest in camps? They stay in camps for yeah. decades. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's yeah. 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 Well, think of all that the Ukrainians that are now spread all over, or people from. Uh, Venezuela, you know, people here in the U.S. are concerned about Venezuelans coming, but um, Peru, Colombia, Ecuador, they've taken millions of Venezuelans. Mm -hmm. A huge portion of their population is now Venezuelan refugees that have been settled in those countries as well. Yeah. Look, at, look at Germany taking in, you know, the Ukrainians. Yes. Uh, and yeah. they, they used to take in, in uh, Turkish, I mean, like you know, the guest yeah. workers, and you know, over, over history. So. Yeah. Yeah, we're not. Yeah. Most I forgot people. about the Muslim ban. Why was that? What was the rationale? Was it, was it, was it, she they were terrorists. Was that it? Yeah, was they scary? were terrorists. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so I know it's not that long ago, I should remember. Yeah. Okay, yeah. just yeah. curious. Uh, this is probably a stupid question, but I noticed in your chart, 11% Karen. Now I presume yeah. we're not talking about Karens. Oh, what nationality is that? Burmese. Burmese. Burmese? Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, I'm sorry, I, Myanmar is the current name, yeah. but they're, they're, they go yeah. by Burmese. They prefer yeah. to use their original name so because Myanmar is Karen like... Is, but Karen is an ethnic... It's an ethnic... It's an ethnic... It's an ethnic, 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 ethnic and, and, and there are other, you know, like like uh, the, Ro, the Rohingya. We don't have any Rohingya here, but yeah. they, they, they went to Bangladesh. And the, but the Karen and the Kareni people, and I don't know other ethnicities, uh, crossed over into Thailand and uh, they're being resettled from there. So, we could go on. I know. <laughs> well, thank so you good. <laughs> once again for um, so much enlightenment. I, I really appreciated you coming here to do this program. Yeah, well, it was, it so, was thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.